is day three of Exponential Manufacturing in Boston. I'm here with Pablos Holman. Pablos is a futurist, inventor, and notorious hacker. He's also helped create the world's smallest PC and MakerBot's 3D printers. He's also the founder of Bombsheller, a company that's at the forefront of apparel manufacturing. Pablos, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's start off. Tell me about Bombsheller, your right. company. Well, the point of Bombsheller was to try and reinvent how apparel manufacturing would work, how an apparel business would work, but using all of the, you know, kind of superpowers we have now with new technologies. And so it's a lot different than a normal apparel company because we don't make anything until somebody clicks buy now. Yeah. And then, you know, it's mostly automated. You know, if we order now on the website, we'll be looking at like rendered images, you know, photorealistic renders of products that some of them we've never made before. Cool. But if you click buy now, then they'll get printed, cut, and sewn tonight, and shipped out tomorrow. And so there's no inventory. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we don't have to guess, you know, months or a year in advance what the market's going to want, what people are going to want, what's going to sell, what's going to be popular, how many of them, what colors, what sizes. We don't have any of those problems. Mm -hmm. Those problems are a big deal in the apparel industry. But also, you know, it means that we can be way more efficient. We never make totally. anything unless we know somebody wants it. Right? And it sounds like when you say this, I'm like, that makes sense. It makes sense. It makes sense, but it yeah. isn't how it's been. But you're talking about a very old industry with lots of stratification, lots of layers yeah. of complexity. Everybody controls one layer, and they're just pushing the guy below them to do their part cheaper. Mm -hmm. And so um, we don't have to do things that way anymore. And right. that's the point of bomb is to show that a different kind of apparel company is possible. A new way of doing yeah. this. Yeah. What inspired you to create the company? Because I'd worked on 3D printing. Mm -hmm. And with 3D printing, you start to imagine, what if we could make things when somebody clicks buy now? What if we could get rid of all the guesswork and get rid of the economies of scale and the Henry Ford assembly lines and all those right. things that we take for granted with mass manufacturing. But the problem is, at the time anyway, 3D printers were still too nascent and they couldn't print things people wanted to buy. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't make a business out of that. But I wanted to experience making a business that was on demand. And so when we made Bombsheller, we figured out we could do it with 3D printing, but we could do it with 2D printing and apparel. And so that's, that's uh, you know, that's the start. We make one thing right now, which is these graphic leggings that yes. mostly women wear for yoga. And How do I get a pair of those? Yes, no, of I'm course. Kidding. They should. You know, you need, they're Just like kidding. the best possible leg. That's the other thing because we have that. You know, we have no middlemen and no yeah. reps or distributors or retailers. You know, we can afford to spend more on the product. Yeah. So we use you know super expensive technical fabrics from Italy mm -hmm. that other companies couldn't afford to use. And the cost is going into the product, not into it's all into these the different supply chains. It's instead chain. of all these yeah. middlemen. That's made a better product, it's made a better experience, it's made uh, you know, more efficient, both like environmentally friendly manufacturing, and it's made um, the, the entire process better for everybody. So yeah, I'd say, and sometimes in tech, you're looking for a way to get like 10x improvement on something. Mm -hmm. Bombsheller is like 100 things that are twice as good. Cool. And it's and it adds up. It definitely does. Yeah. yeah. And so you talk in your talk right now. Um, you're saying about the Silicon Valley egos. Yes. Right. And so in founding a company, yeah. people always say like, "Oh, fail," et cetera, et cetera. But like, yeah. what has your experience been in creating a company? Does it does it hold true with some of those Silicon Valley known truths? Yeah, they are. A lot of them are. And I think you know, what I would say is, like, read zero to one, which is Peter Thiel's book. And yeah. regardless of what you think about. Peter Thiel in any other way. <laughs> it, I believe, I think he's right. Every word of that book is accurate. Okay. That's what I believe. And it saved me from having to write a book. That's the stuff. Because, read zero to one. Yeah, read zero to one because it explains not only like the drivers and how making tech startups works, but also the reasons we do it. Mm -hmm. and this is one of the things I think I didn't get to talk about a lot on stage, but you know, with technology, I come from like the Silicon Valley of the 80s. Which no longer really exists, but the point is to take a new technology, advance it into the world, change the world, and make the world better. And um, that's not really what's going on with a lot of uh, startups these days. Yeah. And you know, a lot of them are not much different than taking a taco wagon and putting it on the internet. Like mm -hmm. that's not really tech. And so you have to be careful and look around and say, okay, 
what am I actually, what problem am I solving and what am I actually trying to accomplish here? And if you yeah. want to put a dent in the universe, you need to find a technology that needs a life. You need to find a problem to solve with it. And a lot of times you have to go searching for that problem. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times now people are trying to, we have this idea called scratch an itch in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. That's one of those Silicon Valley ethos things that I think is outdated because we've really just run out of problems. You know, really? on the West Coast in California, my biggest problem is like my iPhone battery doesn't last all day, you know. <laughs> so this is why you have a lot of people making, you know, iPhone apps to have shit delivered to your dorm room. Right. You know, that's the problem that they have. I don't think those are the biggest problems. Those are not existential problems. No, they're not. And there's, you know, there's problems in the world that a billion people have. Totally. That don't have the same education, resources, money, experience that we have. Yeah. And I think we need to do what we're uniquely good for, and that's um, use all those talents and those abilities to solve bigger problems. You know, make an iPhone app, ship it, that's fine. That's like, But that's like practice. Totally. Those are practice. You know, learn to ship a product, um, but then go, go to where there's a problem that you don't have. Mm -hmm. Sit with somebody, understand it, internalize it, and then bring your resources to it. And that's what we do at the Intellectual Ventures Lab, which is where, mm -hmm. I, which is where I work. Yeah, I think that's so important about like do something that matters, build something yes. that matters. I think um, just what you're saying is one of the biggest problems of Silicon Valley that people are building stuff yeah. that just makes like the wealthy a little bit more comfortable, yeah. and that's you not really. You can make really, a good business yeah. that way, but it's just opportunism. Totally. You know, somebody has to do it. You know, you got to do those things. It's important to make businesses and markets more efficient, all that. But if you want it, your work to be important you're gonna to have to go past that. Take it on a bigger problem, yeah. yeah. And so what does it mean to you to be a notorious hacker? Uh, well, you know, I <laughs> don't know why. How did you become one? I get, get called that. I, I mean, um, that's sort of like, you know, the, I think the only thing happening is like, hackers was kind of a, hacker was kind of a dirty word for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it was so closely associated with like criminal hackers. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not really what's going on where I come from. Um, you know, hackers have amazing and different minds than most people you know. Mm -hmm. They're really important. Hackers are the ones violating the warranty before they got the shrink wrap off. They're the ones who discover and figure out what is technically possible. Yeah. Because they're not reading the directions. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones we need to invent new technologies. And so in the lab, I hire hackers. They can figure anything out. They can figure out what's possible, and that's fundamental to invention. It's fundamental to new technology. Mm -hmm. You just have to um, be willing to try things and figure out things that no one's ever done before. And that's and so I still identify with hackers. I'm not working on security anymore. Yeah. Um, but that's where I come from, and a lot of my friends are they're all hackers, and they've been amazing minds, and they're important. So. Yeah. And so is there a technology that you really have your eye on today, yeah. maybe one that's in its infancy or a current yeah. one that's progressing? Oh yeah, um, that's part of how we cheat. You know, I just collect <laughs> every new scientific discovery, every new chip, every new sensor, algorithm. I try, to, those are like my toolkit. And I just try and understand them and pack them into my brain. And then I'm trying to collect problems pack them in the other side. It's like mm -hmm. a giant Rubik's cube in there and sometimes you get a match. <laughs> that's the that's the way that uh, we invent. Um, yeah. And so some so we'll get we're very aggressive about like trying to pick up new areas in science and new scientific discoveries and use them and ask ourselves, you know, does this change anything humans have ever done? Mm -hmm. You know, can we do it faster, cheaper, better, those things. Um, more humane those things and I think that that's um, you know that's a that's a, a, a great way to be able to invent for for me I feel like I get those every day mm -hmm. I get something <laughs> new every day because the world is advancing a lot and we're in, and we're getting so many new things so yeah I mean I uh, we in a lab we've done a whole bunch of invention in an area a new area in science called metamaterials mm -hmm. um, most people never heard of metamaterials they don't exist in nature um, we got all kinds of superpowers out of that. We're working with uh, nanofabrication techniques from the semiconductor industry to make new mm -hmm. materials. We made one that's thermovoltaic, so you can heat mm -hmm. it up and it makes electrons. It's amazing. Which is an, 
you know, we've been wanting that since we started using electricity. And we have Stirling engines and Peltier junctions. so what would junctions. be an application of that? The application is when you are um, making electricity, usually mm -hmm. burn some crap, uh, heat up water, run a steam turbine, run a generator and spit out electrons. Okay. That process is maybe 60% efficient at best, but it also doesn't scale down very well. Okay. That's why our power plants are so big because you can make a smaller steam turbine, but it doesn't really get cheaper. Mm -hmm. Might as well build it big. So with, uh, if you think of like a solar panel, you know, mm -hmm. they're small and cheap. You shine, throw photons at it, you get electrons. We built something like that, but you give it heat and you get electrons. And we think we'll be able to rival the efficiency of steam turbines and all that, but we can do it at any scale. So I can, you know, run it over a nuclear reactor or a coal plant, but I could also put it over a campfire or burn natural gas at home and make electricity without having to have power grid. There's all kinds of cases like that. We used to fantasize about this with Peltier junctions and Stirling engines, but okay. they were always only a few percent efficient. Yeah. So these are things that can change the world. You know, um, CRISPR obviously is gonna just change everything. Um, there's, and then, uh, you know, all the things, I mean, we're, we're at the beginning with AI. People yeah. bandy about AI, but we're at the beginning. You know, uh, we're just doing machine learning right now. Yeah. There's all kinds of amazing things we can do with machine learning. That's in the toolkit. Um, everything has to be reinvented with machine learning and machine vision and those things. But, you know, we're still a ways from creating the kinds of AIs that we imagine. Yeah. You know, and we think we can see how some of them are possible. And so circling back to yeah. the metamaterials, are there any sure. others that you're working on or oh, that with metamaterials? are super oh, wild? <laughs> metamaterials has been amazing. You know, we've spun out, I think, six companies now using, uh, with inventions based on that. Metamaterials are, uh, give us the ability to manipulate waves. And so you could design metamaterials to work with sound waves or light or anything in between. We've used them to make um, new kinds of antennas mm -hmm. for uh, like satellite communications that give us the ability to do, I mean, we using these antennas, we could get gigabit wireless to everyone on the planet Wow! for cheap. Um, it's important. We've spun out two antenna companies doing that. We made a company that makes low power radars. Radar is big, heavy, expensive, it sucks a lot of power. Ours you could put on a drone and it mm -hmm. can do a collision avoidance for miles. It can see a barbed wire fence or a power line things that you can't do. You could put it on a car and do collision avoidance without the spinning laser that Google uses. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we have another company that's doing um, security imaging. So those backscatter detectors at mm -hmm. the airport, we do live video that way. We can see right through your clothes. It's very exciting. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, there are cases like that, you know, like a soccer stadium or something where you want to be able to check a lot of people really fast right. um, to see if they're, you know, up to no good. So um, there are, uses for that um, yeah so lots of things in metamaterials um, we've been in the coolest one we've just we haven't even spun this company out yet but we've been incubating at the lab we're using them to do power beaming okay. so now I can aim a beam at a drone keep it aloft with no battery mm -hmm. or minimal battery um, forever or you know until and a beam a bird of yeah. it's a beam it's of a beam what? of power of power yeah. And then I could take that same thing, put it in the ceiling, and charge your phone in your pocket wirelessly. And people have been fantasizing about that, and they've come up with a bunch of schemes for doing it, but none of them are really practical. Ours is the first one that I believe is really practical. Cool. So there's so many things that we're getting just out of that. And that all the, the only thing that happened there is, you know, scientists were sort of doing cool party tricks with metamaterials 10 years ago or so. And nobody thought, you know, all the physicists argued and said, you know, it wouldn't actually work for anything useful. But we dove in and said, well, you know, we're gonna try. <laughs> and so we just started trying. And, um, and so, you know, we're probably the epicenter of metamaterials research on planet Earth right now because we just got there early and okay. started trying to internalize a new technology and start okay. mapping it to things we could do with it. So that's another way of inventing. Into yeah. the real applications, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, with that, we're going to wrap up. Pablo, thank oh, you hey, so much. My what pleasure. a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. That was fun.